Good afternoon. Welcome to the Department of Justice Elder Justice Initiative webinar, Adapting Elder Justice Abuse MDTs to a Virtual Environment. I'm going to review a few housekeeping items. Due to the high number of participants, computer audio will be the only option to listen to the presentation. So please make sure that your computer speakers are on. This webinar will be recorded and available on the Department of Justice Elder Justice website after this training. Closed captioning is provided in the pod below the presentation. If you are having any issues viewing closed captioning and do not have an Adobe Connect app installed on your computer, please close out of this meeting, download the Adobe Connect application, and then rejoin the webinar. If you do not wish to download the app, close out of the webinar, Make sure Adobe Flash is enabled on the web browser. Rejoin the meeting and then click on the link and join with the classic view. You can see the screenshot there below. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact me, the host, um, in the chat pod to the right. Now I'm going to turn this over to Talitha Gwynn Shaver, the Elder Abuse Multidisciplinary Team Technical Advisor for the Elder Justice Initiative at the U.S. Department of Justice. Prior to joining the Department of Justice, Ms. Gwen Shaver was the Director of the Elder Abuse Prevention Program at the Institute on Aging, where she served as the Director of the San Francisco, San Francisco Elder Abuse Forensic Center and Chair of the San Francisco Elder Abuse MDT. She has also participated in other MDT models, such as serving on the San Francisco Elder Death Review Team and the Hoarding and Cluttering Task Force. Welcome, Talitha. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that introduction and I appreciate everyone being here with us today. Um, today I want to talk a little bit about what makes a strong multidisciplinary team. And we're going to tackle that before we get into ways that you can adapt your team to a virtual platform because having a strong foundation for your team is really essential um, before you start changing things and looking for new things to do. So we're going to talk about those two things. Um, we're also going to talk about confidentiality concerns and security tips when using video conferencing. Um, we'll talk about virtual communication etiquette. And throughout, we will be exploring real world examples of things that other multidisciplinary teams are doing um, today in this current environment. So this is a project from the Elder Justice Initiative, and our mission is to support and coordinate the Department of Justice's enforcement and programmatic efforts to combat elder abuse, neglect, financial fraud, and scams that target the older adults. Um, the MDT Technical Assistance Center is really here to provide you with tools, resources, and individualized consultations to help you start an MDT, grow an MDT, sustain an MDT. Um, we do that by responding to requests for materials. We do telephone consultations to discuss any issues you might be having with your teams. We do in-person consultations, so we go out to communities and we can do a regional workshop or a workshop with an individual team. Um, we provide webinars and other educational materials. We also have an MDT guide and toolkit to help you walk through the various stages of starting and running an elder abuse multidisciplinary team. And um, a new addition recently is our Elder Abuse Network Locator Map. So if you have an MDT and you would like to be included on the map, you can email me your the information about your team and you will be included on a national map that really just seeks to plot where teams are to, to eliminate the siloing effect that um, a lot of elder justice professionals feel help to connect the field so we can learn from one another and work with one another better. So quickly, when we talk about MDTs today, um, what are we talking about? Today I'm going to take a broad look at multidisciplinary teams. Um, I usually talk about case review teams specifically, and a lot of this information is geared towards case review teams, but it's also applicable to any sort of multidisciplinary team. And really, we're just talking about teams that have representatives from three or more disciplines who are working collaboratively bound by a common purpose. 
there are all sorts of teams. You might have um, an elder abuse team specifically looking at elder abuse. You might have teams that have other missions but who have overlapping populations like a mental illness team, a hoarding team, guardianship teams, financial abuse specialist teams, um, code enforcement teams, um, et cetera. So let's talk about some of the things we know about strong multidisciplinary teams. If you look at the research, um, and while there's not a lot of research specifically around elder justice, um, MDTs, there's more now than there ever has been, but there is a long history of looking at multidisciplinary teams from um, other fields, elder um, child abuse, domestic violence, um, medical partnerships, etc. And one thing that all of these teams across all of these fields have in common is that they embody the, the following five principles. Participatory decision-making, partnership, interdependence, balanced power, and clear process. So when we talk about participatory decision-making, we are talking about enabling the entire team to have a voice in your um, collaboration. So if you're doing case review, it does not mean that you have to have total consensus on what you are going to do for a particular client, nor does it mean that you have to get up your jurisdiction or the policies and procedures that govern your agency and determine your decision making. What this means is that every person around the table um, is, has the ability to share information to share in success, to assist with problem solving, and to have a voice in what the team is doing. Partnership is also critical, and strong multidisciplinary teams have formal MOUs or interagency agreements. Um, it's important for each partner to know what they are contributing, what's expected of them, and what they can expect in return. And these teams understand that their work is interdependent, that the work they do together is greater as a whole than the work that any one professional would do in a, in a siloed effort. So coming together in a group and individual outcomes are influenced by the team. And they have balanced power. And this can be tricky with elder abuse multidisciplinary teams because you might have members who, by virtue of their position within their agency, innately have more power than others. So you might have a prosecutor or somebody from a city attorney's office, and they have more power and authority in city politics than maybe some of the other members that are present. However, on the team, it's important to work to balance that power. Um, when a team does not have a balance of power, communication can really break down. And let alone getting to the actual case review or working on your mission, you can have a lot of other stuff happening, people feeling like they can't talk in meetings, feelings of intimidation, um, et cetera. So there are lots of ways that you can work towards having a more balanced um, sense of power in your team. You could, for instance, rotate the coordinator and have different people host meetings. You can rotate location and have different agencies take the lead in um, hosting the meetings in, in their um, offices. Um, also getting to know one another personally and recognizing that you are all individuals in the room with the same goals and objectives working together and that everyone's voice is equally valuable when working on a common goal. Um, teams that are successful also have clear process. That means um, that they have clear protocols, um, they have predictability and accountability in their process, um, and they also include protocols for conflict resolution should it occur. When I was back in San Francisco and we were starting the Elder Abuse Forensic Center, I really wish I had known something about the stages of team development. A lot of the professionals that are going to be sitting around your table have a lot of education and information about their distinct field. But most of the people on your team will probably not have a business background or a social services background that would lend itself to understanding the dynamics of team development. 
So having even just a very basic understanding of what this process looks like globally can really help your team figure out where they are in the process and what they need to do to get to the next stage of their development. So in the beginning, you have the forming stage. This is really the honeymoon stage. Somebody has um, usually one person or a small group of people have a lot of passion about this issue. They're pulling people together. You are making decisions about what you're going to do with your team um, and how you're going to work together. And everybody is excited to get started. And then you get everybody to the table and you think that now you're, start, you're supposed to start performing um, your function. You've all talked about it and you're all at the table, um, so now you're supposed to be able to do the thing, whatever the thing is that you've agreed you're going to do together. Um, but what happens usually next is storming, the storming phase of development. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is where the ideas that you've talked about have to apply um, in the real world. And you have to have um, the sort of hashing out of what each person's role is, what your processes are going to look like, what your intake procedures are going to look like. Um, you have to sort through all the complications of that collaboration so that you can get to the next stage, which is the norming stage. And this is where you start applying all these principles that you've agreed to. You have some um, predictability. Everybody really understands the process. Everybody's in agreement about what your goals and objectives are. And um, there's a sense of normalcy. You know what to expect from coming to um, your team. And then the next stage is the performing stage. So you get into a habit of what you do. Um, Things become routinized. You know what to expect. You're bringing cases together in the same way. You have the same participants sitting down at the table. You understand how you're going to review the cases, by what method you will um, do case review, if that's what your team is focused on. Um, you understand how you're going to do what, what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, and who is responsible for what, and you're clicking along and, and, and performing. At any stage of your team development, you can go back to a previous stage. So what we see a lot with elder abuse multidisciplinary teams <clears throat> is that there can be high staff turnover. So you may um, have a team that's performing really well, and then you have several new players rotate in. And it can throw you back into the storming phase, having to rehash out some of the things that had already been decided with previous members. Um, there are lots of reasons why you could have changes that affect your performance that would send you back to forming, storming, or norming. Um, you might have different needs coming up from your community, different populations emerging that need assistance. Whatever it is that you're doing, the environment around you is going to be changing. And you'll te your team will have to adapt and, um, and grow. Um, I sat in a child advocacy center training the other day, and I really liked this slide, and so they graciously told me that I could steal it from them. And I just thought it was um, an interesting perspective. <clears throat> when we talk about multidisciplinary teams, we always talk about the role of the coordinator or the facilitator, as it's called in this um, slide. And I want to help you understand what this function really is. So this slide talks about the difference between presentation, training, and facilitation. So today on this webinar, what we are doing here is presentation. The focus is on content, the deliverable is information, and the approach is to present or tell. And it's about 80% telling and 20% listening. A training is focused on content and process. The deliverable is skill development, and the approach is to teach or involve, and it's about 50-50 telling and listening. The facilitator's role is different. The facil facilitator is to be focused on process, and the deliverable is group insight or decisions. You should come out of your um, meeting knowing what's going to happen next, what you have decided on. 
and the approach is to ask and guide. So it's about 20% telling and 80% listening. The facilitator is there to guide the process to make sure that everybody has signed their confidentiality agreements, that they are um, have, they have a balance of power as they are talking around the table, that they are holding together all these pieces of how the team functions and how it can um, thrive. A key element of having a successful team is psychological safety. And this might feel a little woo-woo to some of the disciplines that might be on um, the webinar today, but this is actually a, a, um, a core component that many businesses and industries recognize that they must have this on their teams. And um, this information was actually adapted from Google. So Google recognizes that their teams must have psychological safety if they're going to meet their goals and objectives. So what is psychological safety? It is a sense of confidence that the team will not embarrass, reject, punish someone for speaking up. It's a team climate characterized by interpersonal trust and mutual respect in which people are comfortable being themselves. <clears throat> So I thought I would give you this little checklist and um, you can take it back to your team and evaluate for psychological safety. Um, it's a series of questions um, that can really give you some insight. So if you make a mistake on your team, is it often held against you? Can members of your team bring up problems and tough issues? Do people on this team sometimes reject others for being different? Is it safe to take a risk on this team? Is it safe to ask other members of this team for help? That's critical for a multidisciplinary team. That is why you are all there together. Um, do team members deliberately act in a way that undermines another person's efforts on the team? Um, do members of this team value and utilize your unique skills and talents? <clears throat> So another thing that's a little more concrete that we know about strong multidisciplinary teams is that they have clear, clearly defined mission, vision, and goals. And to aid your team in the process of developing those items, there's a link to our guide and toolkit, um, chapter four, building a strong foundation where you can find lots of information about how to do that well. Strong teams also have clear organizational rules. This means they clearly understand and agree upon the interpretations of their state laws and statutes, first and foremost. Um, there's a link there so you can review what your state laws um, actually say about multidisciplinary teams. Um, strong teams have identified somebody to serve as a coordinator. They have created their MOUs for participating agencies. They've written their protocols. And so all of these are links that will give you examples of these materials so that you don't have to start from nothing to create them. Another thing that we see in strong teams is that they recognize the need to refine what they are doing. They have to be adaptable. Managing an MDT require, requires ongoing commitment and resources. This means investment in time, training, um, staffing, money, developing trust and team building, regular review of process and policies and procedures, and the, the ability to resolve conflict. So how do you build trust? <clears throat> um, these are some tips for building trust for any sort of team. Get to know each other personally. Have strong, clear, and agreed upon collaboration documents. Active listening. Try to understand one another's perspectives and clarify when needed. I can't tell you how many simple misunderstandings happen on teams that are completely avoidable. Um, so a funny example is um, a team that was talking about a case and two of the social workers were saying they needed to go, get, um, go do a MOCA and the law enforcement officer at the table was thinking and finally asked somebody, why are they going to get coffee? Um, so they were talking about a mental status exam and um, the terminology was not common across everybody at the table and little misunderstandings can occur, sometimes big misunderstandings. Um, another way to cultivate trust is to address problems and conflict head on and promptly. 
and to hold one another accountable kindly. Um, also, don't play the blame game. There's nothing that erodes trust on a team quicker than pointing the finger at one another and laying blame at one agency or one person. You are there to help focus um, all of the work of the team on the solutions um, and supporting one another's work. And also working cases together is just a phenomenal way to build trust. It helps you, it helps to humanize the other participants of the team. You see them and their effort and the barriers and obstacles and challenges that they have within their agencies to do the work. And um, it creates bonds and it creates trust. And a very important thing is to remember why you're here. And if you're a case review team, that's because of your clients. I've seen some teams take a really um, unique approach to this. So there are actually several teams now that I have seen do this where they have a picture of the client that they are talking about either projected up on a screen while they are presenting their case or passing a photograph around. And it helps ground all of this theoretical conversation that people are having into the reality that of this one person's life. So MDTs at the best, at their best, have meetings, they aren't meetings. A lot of people will say, I'm going to the MDT, and that means they're going to the MDT meeting. But MDTs are more than their meetings. It's really about the relationships that you are building and the ways that you are facilitating communication and collaboration because of the relationships that you have on this team. So MDTs are relational and expand connections and knowledge. They refine and streamline process. They are active, collaborative, and seek improved client outcomes. And they embrace innovation and are highly adaptable. Therefore, MDTs can change and improve in this current environment. So let's think about this environment that we're in right now. If your team feels like they have been trying to keep your heads above water, um, you're not alone. A lot of teams have been struggling since um, since COVID, the COVID epi epidemic has really shaken up the way everybody in every industry and in every agency and every job is doing their work. It has affected everything. And learning new ways to deal with these is, is critical. And so I wanted to just briefly look at um, uh, an example um, of something that we can learn from the world of surfing. So there are five principles that you have to learn when you're surfing, and I just thought these were good ways to think about how you keep your head above water. Um, the first is determination, having the will to persevere. The second is balance. Right now, balance is more critical than ever before because you're trying to do things in a new way, and yet you must maintain a commitment to the standards of practice, a commitment to your clients, and more than ever, a commitment to your self-care. Having flexibility is critical, so being willing to incorporate new technology, partnerships, and perspectives. And strengths. The strength of your team is in the relationships you have with your partners, so leaning heavily into um, those relationships. And endurance. We know that the challenges that we are experiencing today may persist over a long time, and our solutions um, may have to adapt. We may try things, and they may not work. They may work for a little while, and we're going to have to keep persevering um, so that we can um, do the work that we really want to be doing for our teams. So I have seen teams respond in a variety of ways. And I think during this um, current epidemic, a lot of things that were sort of under the surface have become much more visible. So we have seen teams decide to refocus their work and um, address some of the things that they feel like they can, where they feel like they can make a difference um, on some of these big issues that have come forward. So we see teams that are working on countering ageism identifying and filling gaps in the safety net by working on policy or protocol between agencies. Um, some teams are, have decided to focus on standards of care and long-term care facilities. Um, and then we have other teams that are developing safety and action plans for similar future emergencies. 
there are other teams who, who have decided to continue their case review or similar client-driven work while making appropriate adaptations. So this next section will contain things to consider and tips to continue um, your MDT-related work. The first and probably most obvious adaptation is social distancing. So teams that have to work with older adults are looking for ways to reduce the number of professionals who have to have face-to-face -face contact with older adults. This is something that your team can really assist with, where you have good coordination on your team. Um, you can determine who is the most appropriate person to glean the most pertinent pieces of information that you need to move a case forward. Um, there are limitations to that. Obviously, you can't become a police officer if you're not one. You can't be a social worker if you're not one. Same in the medical field. But a lot of time, there is really basic information that the various professionals on your team need to take the next step and identifying one person to be the one to have those that face-to-face -face contact, con, uh, contact can be really useful. Also, we see teams are trying to stay connected with phone calls between necessary visits, um, triaging cases so that in-person contact only occurs in emergencies, defining emergency needs and conditions for contact if you are going to um, go that route, and practicing safe contact using safe distances, gloves, and masks when you do have contact with older adults. So let's talk a little bit about working remotely. Um, when you think about teleconferencing, the very first thing you need to consider is what type of platform you should choose. And this is a good place to start collaborating with your partners. You may have a partner that already has um, a teleconferencing, video conferencing platform that they can share with the team. Um, they may have a license that they can expand and, and share that platform with the team and reduce cost. It's also good to identify what sort of platforms your team may have familiarity with because that lessens the learning curve um, that exists whenever you begin to try um, working remotely. <clears throat> the number one consideration I've heard from all teams um, lately when talking about teleconferencing or video conferencing is confidentiality. So I want to let you know that the majority of video conferencing platforms have HIPAA compliant for pay tiers. Almost all video conferencing platforms have a HIPAA compliant for pay tier. So if you are looking for HIPAA compliant um, platforms, talk to the technical support of whichever platform you're looking at and see exactly what they uh, have put in place because a lot of these big um, teleconferencing platforms have already been working with doctors and physicians for a long time on telehealth issues and they've worked out a lot of the stuff so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And in order to maintain um, confidentiality, you are going to have to comply with security protocols to be effective. So um, I think a lot of people will get the right tier and they'll start doing their work and um, they aren't following the protocol and so they may have breaches. So it's very important to make sure your team understands the security protocol that must be put in place. It's also um, interesting that I have seen quite a few teams adding language to their confidentiality agreements to cover remote communication. So making sure that your um, confidentiality agreements don't just say that you're keeping a confidential any information you hear in your meeting, um, but that you're, you are making sure that you're covering any form of communication that your team members might have about a particular case. Um, let's talk a little bit about enhancing security. So a lot of these platforms, like the one that you um, use today, <clears throat> have a waiting room. And this is an added security barrier. So if you have done any telehealth with your physician lately, you've probably logged on and you've waited for your physician to log on and then accept you into your, your meeting space for your session. Um, these waiting room rooms provide an extra layer of security, whereas you might have a link to send out to your team um, for a place to go to um, have your meeting, a meeting address. 
if anybody else were to get a hold of that meeting address in some way, they could go to the meeting. So having a waiting room um, adds a layer of security because the facilitator can allow people in or disallow people in. You can make that decision about who gets into the meeting. Waiting rooms also give you a place to display confidentiality agreement language. Um, you can usually have a screen up as people are gathering and you can have that information displayed there. I've also seen teams that have utilized uh, the group chat features in a lot of these platforms um, to ask if the participants have read, understood, and agreed to the confidentiality statement that the team has. You can also kick participants out of the meeting for non-compliance. So if they have not, if you've asked, do you agree to the confidentiality statement and somebody has, does not participate in that, you can remove them from the meeting. And some teams have maintained a chat record of that piece of their meeting where people have verbally or typed in their agreement um, to the confidentiality rules. So in addition to confidentiality, there are security um, considerations. The first and most important one is do not use open Wi-Fi. So if you're working from home, make sure that your Wi-Fi has a password on it. Some people cannot work from home. You may have law enforcement or nurses or other personnel, social workers who have to be out in the field. And if you are one of those individuals, making sure that when you're logging on for your meetings that you're using a secure Wi-Fi connection, that you're not like getting on the, the Starbucks um, Wi-Fi or some other cafe's Wi-Fi or, or whatever. You need to make sure you're using um, a secure Wi-Fi connection. Also, don't hold meetings in public spaces. So if you are one of the people who have to work in the field, make sure you can go into an office or in your car or wherever it is that you're going to be where you can isolate yourself so other people can't see what's happening on your screen. Um, another tip to that, and I ha I've seen this in Washington, D.C., actually walking down, down um, the sidewalk this very important federal building and this individual had their desk set up in such a way that their screen was completely visible from the street and they were sitting there typing affidavits. So don't make a blunder like that. Be aware of the public space around you and make sure that you, your screen isn't visible to those that you don't want to see it. Another important tip is to keep your software updated. This can be um, very annoying, right? You get all these little pop-ups that say to update your security. I know I'm always one that says, ah, I'll do that later. I've got something I need to do right now. But right now in this environment, it's really critical to keep your software updated because there are security patches that are coming through continually to make sure that your platform stays secure and can't be breached. You also need to stay current with the protocols and professional guidelines of your group. So you may have um, direct information about how and when and why you should be using uh, remote communication. So if that information has come out from your profession, make sure that you are aware of what those protocols are and that what you're doing as a team doesn't violate any of the protocols or guidelines that you've been asked to put, asked to put in place. Another thing worth mentioning here is etiquette. So a lot of us are new at video conferencing and having these remote meetings and um, wanted just to throw out some etiquette tips. So first, test your audio and video ahead of a meeting. Make sure that your late face is lit and visible, so not having any light sources behind you. That's your Photography 101 um, lesson for the day. Make sure your light sources are above or in front of you. Um, don't take your device with you to the bathroom, even if you think you've got it on mute or whatever it is. Um, very bad things have happened. You've seen probably some people go viral and be discussed on the news for that little faux pas. Um, make sure that you mute your line when you aren't speaking so you don't have background noise interfering with your, your call. And unmute your line when you are speaking, so you have to remember that you did that and undo it when it's time for you to participate. Just like in any other meeting, you want to come prepared. Um, 
it, when at all possible, don't multitask and be respectful of everyone's time. Another critical feature is training. So make sure your members understand how to use the new tools and resources that you're going to be employing. So I recommend that your team um, hold at least one practice session where you're not even going to get into the meeting content. You're making sure everybody knows how to log on, how to use their um, webcam, how to test their sound, that they're visible, they're in a good place, they can hear you, you can hear them, all of that um, before you try to host your first meeting. Other collaborative tools exist as well, even though they're not getting as much attention as video conferencing, but your team may want to look at using shared calendars, um, using a listserv to send information out to all of the members of your team at one time, using instant messaging, and also cloud computing um, as a way to share working documents. <clears throat> if your team is looking into um, moving into telehealth, um, I want to acknowledge that telehealth is a much more complex thing than just hosting a virtual meeting. In a virtual meeting, you may be talking about clients, but you're talking amongst one another. You aren't actually having face-to-face -face contact with your client. Um, if you are going to have that face-to-face -face contact with your clients, you need to make sure that you are using a HIPAA compliant software program, that you're not just um, picking up your phone and doing whatever video conferencing comes for free packaged on your phone because guaranteed that's not HIPAA compliant. Um, if you want to look at it as an, at an, a good example from the federal government of a telehealth program that works really well, you can look at the, um, the VA's telehealth program. So they have been very generous with their time. Um, I have actually had people from their tech team reach out and answer questions that I was able to pass on to others. So if you know anything about the VA system um, and you want and you have any contacts there or if you want a connection to them, looking at their telehealth program is a really good example of people who are doing it well. Um, all of the previous tips that we talked are also inclusive in telehealth, but telehealth, as I said, is more complicated. So I wanted to give you two links to resources that I think can really assist your team um, with thinking about using technology in an appropriate way. And the first is techsafety.org. This is a group that was originally formed around domestic violence service, and the entire purpose of this project is to understand how to use technology safely with your clients. And they have lots of really wonderful information on their site. The other one is reachingvictims.org, and they recently held a uh, five-part national strategy session on sustaining um, services during uh, this time of COVID. And you can listen to or read the transcripts of those strategy sessions and look at the other resources that they have on their webpage as well. So they've, they've sort of dug into this issue a bit and um, your team can start from, from there. <clears throat> Let's talk about some virtual facilitation tips. <clears throat> so if you are the team facilitator, um, think about the following things. The first thing is you need to choose the right platform for your meeting needs. Um, you need to consider the number of people who are going to be using the technology. Again, if you need a HIPAA compliant platform or not. So choosing the right platform is very important. Test your technology prior to a meeting and sign on early. Hold a practice session with your team. Use video. It can be hard to convince team members to use their video. We're in people's homes. It feels really different than being in a professional setting. Um, but it really adds a lot to the meeting to be able to look at one another, see one another, um, read those facial expressions, um, and have that, that eye contact that, that is really useful whenever you are in a team that is so bound by relationships. So I highly recommend using the video when at all possible. Um, also provide alternate call-in options in case the video um, isn't going to work. <clears throat> 
Another key way to make these virtual meetings work a little bit better is to divide responsibilities. So have one team, team member who is selected to facilitate the meeting itself and another one that's going to run the technical aspect of the meeting. So making sure everybody gets the right link, everybody gets into the room, any sound issues are addressed, any questions that come up of a technical nature during the meeting, this person can deal with while the facilitator continues the meeting. Maintain the roles and structures of your in-person meetings where possible. So for example, have an agenda, have your clear objectives, um, clarify action items at the end of the meeting. Try to carry over as much of that structure into your virtual meetings as possible. Use an icebreaker. Everybody hates icebreakers. I hate icebreakers when I'm in a meeting and people say, okay, we're going to start with an icebreaker. I always get just like a knot in my stomach. I don't like it. Nobody likes it. And it's really good and useful anyway. So just do it. <laughs> um, if you have a team that knows each other really well and you're always working together, you don't need to use some sort of a, a formal icebreaker. But do allow some time either at the beginning or end of your call for some casual chit chat before you get into um, the heart of your meeting or after you've wrapped it up. Um, encourage participation by calling on team members. So if there are people who are sitting and observing but who haven't really participated, um, go ahead and ask for that participation and invite people in. Some people feel a little intimidated by using these virtual platforms and may choose to just kind of sit and listen rather than participate. So try to bring them in. And minimize the presentation links when at all possible. And this last piece is really critical. We're all in this new world and we're all trying to figure this out together. So be forgiving of normal life intrusions. So people have partners and kids and pets and more now more than ever deliveries. And all of this is happening in homes where you're also trying to get your work done. So when those intrusions happen, just laugh them off and keep going. Um, because it's going to happen to probably all of us at some point. <clears throat> Here are some additional resources for you. Um, one is specifically around coronavirus. Uh, we also have our elderjustice.gov website where you can get lots of information about multidisciplinary teams, both of the technology projects that I mentioned before have the links to here and also Harvard Business Review is a .org and they have lots of really good information about ways to help your team function well during this um, this current environment. So I want to go ahead and put my contact information up here so if you have any questions that you know how to reach me you can email me or call me. Um, usually email is the best way to, to get on my radar and to get something scheduled for um, a conversation and I do want to turn it over now for some questions. <clears throat> And Camille or Eliza, if there are any questions that you saw come in that you'd like for me to address, would you mind letting reading them out to me now? I have one of for course. you. Um, are there any sure. examples of confidentiality, confidentiality agreements with language that includes use of virtual meeting platforms? What would you suggest? I don't know of any teams that have made those confidentiality agreements available to other people. <clears throat> I have seen teams be very protective of the adaptations that they're making right now. But I would suggest that you follow the same protocol that you followed when you first developed your confidentiality agreements. Bring those people to the table to have this discussion and to make sure that you are broadening the language in a way that feels right with all of the um, legal folks who are probably a part of your team, whether it's prosecutors or city attorneys or um, legal representation for your agency, whoever it is that came in and helped develop those original pieces of documentation should be involved in this um, aspect of changing those. Okay, thank you. And there's another one. 
Any suggestions on how to not speak each speak over each other on a virtual platform? Yeah, that can be tricky because you sometimes have little sound delays um, because you're you're over the, you're going over the web. Um, there are lots of ways that you can sort of help this. You can have a very structured agenda where you know each person is going to take a certain point and you go in order. Um, one of the things that we do on our team calls um, here at the um, Elder Justice Initiative is the facilitator goes down the row of individuals for updates. So they give their update and then they call on each person to give their update. A lot of these platforms also have a feature where you can raise your hand. And so if you push that, the person who is facilitating the meeting knows that you have something to contribute and then they can say um, something back to you and to let you know it's time to talk. Is there any other Hey, thank you. How do you convince people to commit their time to help build the team and improve the MDT process, especially during this time? Well, I mean, it can be challenging to get people to want to commit their time. I think that the important thing to understand and to convey to your team is that there's not another option. Right now, you really have to get this right, or your team is is not going to be the strong team that you once were. This is a critical part of your work. It's not a, um, it's, it's not an elective. It's not something that you can choose in or out of really if you are committed to your team. So, you know, I would have to say that people get it a lot faster than maybe it seems like you will. I think after you have one or maybe two practice sessions with people, people understand how to use that technology. And then you're just going to get into the flow of your meetings like you had um, in person. So really try to encourage and let people know that this is a critical component of your work together. Okay. Um, what platforms are most teams using? So I am not allowed to endorse particular platforms, but I can say that looking at the VA would be a good example of um, platforms that the government has decided are a good tool to use. Um, also, working within your, if you are in an agency where you have um, a an IT department, a tech department, and they are familiar with these various platforms, going to them. But I would suggest using one of the big main um, teleconferencing or video chatting softwares that are out there and making sure you're using the right tier that's HIPAA compliant if you need that level of security. Okay. Um, do you have suggestions on how to keep police officers interested in MDTs while they are dealing with so many other issues right now? Yeah, I think this really has to do with the flexibility of your team. I think the interest is there, but you have law enforcement that are exhausted, um, worn down, working 12-hour shifts or more, working seven days in a row or more. Um, <clears throat> So you're going to have to be sensitive to their ability to participate. So I would say communicate with those participants is more critical now than ever. You want to find a time when they have 30 minutes or an hour to come to your meeting. Also making sure that the meetings that you're inviting them to, you actually need the input of law enforcement for that meeting. So if you were talking about a client that needs any other services, there's not a component where you need a police report or the um, you need the police to take action of some kind on your case, let them know that they aren't needed for that meeting and that you're valuing their time because it is very tricky to balance that right now. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another one. We have a new MDT that meets in the DA's, DA's office where I work. We asked at the first and second meetings for nominations for a facilitator and secretary and we have not received any. I don't want the DA's office to be running every meeting, but so far that's the way it has gone. Do you have any suggestions for encouraging members? We have a lot of them to take a leadership role. Um, well, I think that you could suggest doing rotating um, 
having the meeting rotate to the different parties. And if nobody is signing up, maybe try assigning various meetings to different groups. So you could say next week or our next meeting um, is going to be facilitated by this group, the following one by that group. We're going to come up with um, a schedule for the various agencies to have a voice in and participate and run these meetings since we don't seem to have um, some a volunteer for this position. So you might either get a volunteer out of that um, or you can sort of balance um, the, the workload for your members. You can also try nominating a person. So if you know somebody on your team um, understands technology more than others, you can ask them directly, would they mind being the facilitator of the meetings, even if they have a different role on the team usually. And again, looking at ways that you can split up the responsibilities so everything doesn't fall on one person, inviting somebody to do the technical piece, another person to actually facilitate the dialogue that's happening in the meeting. And there may be other ways to break it up depending on what your meeting format looks at looks like, but giving, sort of spreading that responsibility around so it doesn't fall on just one person. Great, thank you. Have teams shifted from one format to another over time? For example, started on systemic issues and then moved to case review, guardianship, et cetera, or do they tend to start spin off? Um, you know, I have seen a lot of teams adapt like that. And I've been on teams that have adapted like that. You might start a team and you realize that very thing, like you, you've you come together because there was a, a gap in the way a couple of agencies work together or you, everybody wanted to work on a policy issue together and you do that thing. But in the process of doing that thing, you become aware of other things that are needed in your community. And so I have seen teams that have said, okay, now we know how to work with each other on educational outreach or, um, you know, procedures of our policies of the way that our organizations work together. Um, now we'd like to start hearing cases. Let's pull additional people into these meetings and see how we can get that done. That's a very common thing. Spinoffs are also common. So you might have a team that is doing larger elder abuse work and you realize that the majority of your cases are maybe financial abuse. And so you might want to have special meetings that are specifically for that issue. Either way is fine. Um, it, it doesn't doesn't matter so much how that evolution happens as long as it's an evolution that works for your team and your community. Okay, um, I'm seeing one more. Other parties rarely will bring cases and APS ends up bringing most of the cases. How do we encourage others to bring cases and do we cancel if we do not have enough cases? Yeah, that's really for a different presentation. That's a very deep question and that, that is really more of, you know, starting and running uh, a multidisciplinary team. But we do have tools in the MDT guide and toolkit that are about generating that buy-in and, um, and addressing that issue. I think you need to first look at the structure and format of your team. How have you agreed to intake your cases and is that working? And if it isn't working, going back to the drawing board and thinking again about how you're going to intake your cases. I know teams that only have cases come through Adult Protective Services and some teams like it and some teams wish it were another way. Um, some teams do th that way intentionally because <clears throat> The, having APS involvement is one of the criteria of um, their investigation. So they want to make sure there's an open case with APS first, and then they bring in all of the other parties. So some people want that sort of layer. Um, also, because some APS offices, APS is different, has different protocol in every state, but some APS um, offices have confidentiality pieces that are critical to how the MDT functions. And so they want teams to go through that process. They want a case to go through that process before it comes to the team. Other teams are really open and we see law enforcement or DA's offices um, bringing cases. I think the best way to encourage that is to talk about what cases they are seeing in their office and where they're having problems. Because if they are working on elder abuse cases, it's one thing if they aren't. If they are working on elder abuse cases, they are going to have challenges. And this team is there to help alleviate the challenges that they have when they're working through these cases. These cases are very complex. And as soon as they hit a blip in the road, let them know that 
That's the function of this team. This team isn't here to give you more work to do. This team is here to triage these challenges that we all have as we work these very complicated cases. If you want more about buy-in, I believe that's in Chapter 2 of our Guide and Toolkit. Are there any other questions? If you have not seen any other questions right now. <clears throat> okay, well, if you think of anything after this webinar, feel free to reach out to me, shoot me an email. I'm happy to, to help you. If you're looking for ways to start that virtual communication with your team, I'm happy to give you an individualized consultation around that. And my contact information is um, up on the screen right now. Liza, Camille, is there anything else from you? I see nothing so. Thank, Thank everybody you so for much. coming, and I hope you have a wonderful day.